<laughs> Thank you. Um, welcome everyone to week 12 of Open Life Science cohort number four. Um, um, when we begin these calls, uh, here's a usual reminder that um, we have a code of conduct and we have some community participation guidelines, which basically says, be nice, be respectful, be kind. Um, if you experience or witness any unacceptable behaviors or have any other concerns, you can contact uh, the organizers of Open Life Science, that is Berenice, Malvika, myself, and yo, at team at openlifescience.org. If it concerns one of us, please use our individual ad email addresses that are listed on the notes document, line 55. Um, we have breakout rooms today, so uh, what I'm going to ask everyone to quickly do is um, if you could rename yourself according to uh, your preference for participating in the breakout rooms. Sorry, this is a bit confusing, but the instructions for this is on line 15 of the Interpad. So if you would like to participate in the breakout room, um, uh, in the spoken breakout room, uh, please add an S before your Zoom name and if you would like to participate instead in a written reflection-based exercise, um, then you could put a W in front of your name. <laughs> Malvika, Q is not very helpful. <laughs> it's not probably a typo, I understand. Um, so I'll just give everyone, oh, thanks for, thanks for putting the instructions in the chat though. Thanks, so look at, <laughs> look at Malvika's instructions in the chat. Um, but I'll give everyone a few couple of um, seconds just to rename yourselves. Okay, um, I see most folks have done that. So thank you for doing that. Um, and it will really help us sort you into breakout rooms later. So I feel like this onboarding section is particularly short. Uh, Yo, did I miss something that had been talked about? No, nope, you've just gotten so used to it that it just flows. <laughs> okay, always good to double check. Well, um, so that's all the housekeeping for today. But so without further ado, we'll head straight into a very um, a topic that is really important, very close to our hearts at OLS, um, diversity and inclusion. And um, with that, we also, uh, as the second part of this call, we'll be doing uh, something called an Ally Skills Workshop. Um, you'll hear, you'll learn all about what that is later and you'll get a chance to participate as well. Um, so uh, we're gonna start off today um, thinking about sort of our roles as open leaders. So as we um, build open projects for research um, and our other dreams and visions, um, we wanna make sure that we build those projects to empower others to collaborate within our um, inclusive communities. Um, so for that, we'd love you to take um, five minutes to reflect on what that means to be in an inclusive space and to participate in an inclusive community. Um, so there are two questions on line 66 and 67 that we'd like you to take some time to silently in your own space reflect on. What's the place that's made you feel included the first time you've visited? This could be online or in person. Um, and what has made that place so inclusive for you? So take a moment to think about it and then you could gradually put down your thoughts um, on the notes document under line 68 at the moment. So let's spend five minutes just doing that and then we'll have a look at each other's answers.
Sorry about the weight limit issue, folks. Um, our previous solution has been to refresh, which I'm sure you all tried already. <laughs> but I hope you've, um, you're still managing to read and type some, write down some things. Um, Alma Vika has a great suggestion. If you can't, uh, please leave it in the chat and we can always, um, document that later as well. Yeah, I, I don't know if it would help. That's certainly not the best uh, interaction option possible, but I wonder if, if typing it on, you know, like a notepad and then pasting it in would be any better or not. I'm not sure. <laughs> I am seeing some responses coming in, and if you if you if your response is a bit truncated, and you'd like to, yeah, you know, <laughs> you'd like to you'd like to have your answer uh, written up, then um, yeah, I guess this yeah, if we if you could either type that in a notepad and move it over, or type it in the Zoom chat and we can move it over. I guess that's that's what we can manage now. Um, but but we we'll keep an eye on the situation and and try and see what we can do about next time. But meanwhile, I have, I'm seeing a lot of colorful answers coming in. Um, so I wonder if, um, if anyone would like to share um, by unmuting themselves directly. I can share maybe. Um, yeah, so uh, I immediately had to think about when I started as a student and I uh, joined a student association and I felt very wel wel welcome, uh, although I didn't know, know it before. And I think uh, what made it so inclusive uh, was that uh, it was actually founded with uh, having an uh, in mind that it would not be for, uh, yeah, have any foundation in a certain religion or political view, and that made it, yeah, make makes it a very open place that a lot of people like to join and, uh, yeah, something like that. <laughs> it's a bit hard to describe, but uh, yeah, I felt really valued there when I joined. Thank you. Yeah, so feeling valued is, is one of those things that I also see here. Alejandro has written that for the Turing way as well. Feeling valued is being part of that community. Um, um, Esther says, similarly for the Turing way and for all S, thank you. <laughs> Valuing all the contributions um, and the, t the time that everyone is spending to build towards something that, um, also, I think Aaron, you also mentioned, you know, about, you know, the, the, um, there's no sort of prerequisites or, or hurdles there as well, no judgment on, on where you've come from. So Esther said this as well. Um, and, and I see um, that this has resonated um, in this group, which is great to see. Um, anyone, anyone else would like to share their experience? 
I can share, perhaps. Go ahead, Eva. Uh, so maybe a brief explanation because uh, I already insert uh, my input uh, to the file. So one, one of my uh, role is uh, the observer to the International Commission on the Protection of the Other River. Uh, when I'm observer from the non-governmental organization side. Um, <clears throat> and usually uh, we observers are uh, kind of kind in um, opposition to the, um, at least partly to the, to the <clears throat> official positions of the government representative. So you can imagine that sometimes it uh, can be uh, quite tricky to be, uh, to be observer. Mm. But uh, I remember when I joined uh, to the um, to the commission, um, it was very, I mean, it it was very pleasant for me because they uh, they assured that uh, and they showed um, that uh, despite we may have like like uh, different uh, points of view, uh, etc. Uh, that's the the place and the, um, the people are um, their representatives uh, it, that's it's like safe and uh, open-minded and uh, ready to um, take in uh, the contra arguments uh, and they expressed uh, it like in uh, in being um, respective and uh, making my contribution visible. So that was uh, one of the cases. Uh, I think it's worth to bring it up because it's not it's not always work like that, and that's it's really good case. Definitely, thanks for sharing that, Eva. I think that's a very nice, that, yeah, really, really nice to hear that example because especially when you have you know sort of obviously contradicting backgrounds yeah. and viewpoints being open-minded and and being willing to listen and really empathize is like in your case it's really shown to be so powerful exactly. um and and i really love that example for that reason it's really yes. really hard i would love to learn how to build this type of spaces um yeah and yeah lots of lots of great sharing um stories here folks uh, if you if you read through these so inspired and the world just seems like a much better place for me right now <laughs> which is really really great um, um such a warm feeling um but yeah uh, also a lot of you mentioned you know people uh, community organizers or other community folks in the community who's taken really that extra step to make newcomers feel welcomed and onboard people um that again that, that element of respect and, and expectation and uh, transparency in terms of expectation um yeah, all of these things and, and all came from you. So, so thank you for that. And I hope we have a better understanding collectively about you know, how to build such a space, hopefully. But um, without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to you. Super, thanks folks for um, some really, really interesting and in some ways, I guess, vulnerable discussions about what helped make, make you feel included. Um, so we're very lucky today, we have a speaker, uh, we have Deb Nicholson with us, who is going to talk about five ways to build inclusive teams. Um, so I've been very lucky to see some of her uh, keynotes and previous conferences around this, this topic, and she also comes from a fantastic open source background. Um, but Deb, I'm sure you'll introduce and in, get myself very tongue tied there. I'm sure you'll introduce yourself better than I can. So over to you. Uh, yeah, okay, thanks. Um... Yeah, I'm actually between things right now. I just finished uh, over at the Open Source Initiative for a year, but I managed to always keep a lot of projects in between. Uh, the Seattle GNU Linux project and a number of others. Uh, but uh, let me see, I do have, basically I wanted to kind of talk about like five things that I think are really important for building inclusive teams and why each of those things are important and then give a couple examples. So I did make slides. Uh, I'll try and share them. It doesn't always work with Zoom. Um, so we'll see. Uh, okay. Well, you might get the side. <laughs> okay. Uh, how does that look? Okay, great. But you're going to get the side slides. There's not that many, so it's okay. Um, anyway, uh, yeah. So um, 
in thinking about teams, like it's uh, it's not really a team if it's not inclusive. So that to me is the most important. Um, and I think so when you're starting to think about setting uh, setting an inclusive tone, which is really important because it's very hard to remake a first impression. And that means that the beginning, like the first conversation you have with people, the impression that they get when they come into the room or join the project or uh, come into your virtual space is really important. Uh, we obviously, this group already has a code of conduct. So, um, and there's a lot that's been written about that, but uh, I guess I'll just add that yours should be complete, uh, specific enough for the work that you're doing together with people and actionable. So there should be consequences. Um, there, uh, I think when people first started doing codes of conduct, uh, there were a lot that were in the category of like, be excellent to each other. And that's not particularly actionable. Uh, and you can call it expectations or you can put it in a project or an employee handbook, uh, but wherever you do it, you, you should have something that sets down the expectations for conduct. Uh, and uh, I do highly recommend doing uh, an onboarding session with each new person. Uh, and one of the reasons like this helps you create that great first impression, uh, but it also helps you highlight the expectations that you have written down. Sometimes projects have something written down that they've had written down for a long time. And, uh, and it's, you know, or somebody wrote it aspirationally and the project doesn't really live those values. Onboarding on a one on one situation lets people know that uh, those expectations are real, that there's something you talk about, that there are values that you incorporate into the everyday running of your project. Uh, so uh, the other thing I would say is make yourself available. So when new people join your project, you want to make sure that they know that they can come to you uh, with problems or concerns. And uh, this is really important because if you don't let people know that they can come to you, then you won't really know what's going on with them and you won't really know what's going on with the work that they're doing. And that can lead to some really bad surprises. And I, I know um, I know we're all busy. So the idea of making yourself available like constantly all the time probably sounds a little overwhelming. Uh, one thing that you can do is set up like a weekly office hours or uh, like a weekly meeting with each of your reports or each of the people that you work with on a specific thing so that you set up a specific time and say, hey, uh, Thursdays are the day that we talk about what's going on with the project and how your work is doing. Uh, and what obstacles you're encountering and if there's anything that I can do to make things better. Uh, another thing, um, this is uh, number two, is make sure everybody knows where everything is. Um, a lot of projects, uh, it, it, it's uh, the temptation to put things in all different places because different tooling comes around or uh, different websites, different ways of organizing your thoughts and your work. Uh, folks like new stuff, especially in tech. And so uh, you wanna make sure that everyone knows where everything is. And one main place is the best. Uh, even if you have like, so maybe you have links to documents that are linked in your Git repository or you have like a Git repository that's linked in your project's wiki, but there's one main place that you can go even if it does link to some outside resources, uh, but everything's discoverable in that same place. And a great way to make sure that these those documentation details and those resource details stay up to date is to have everyone contribute. So as soon as people arrive, they have to be able to uh, contribute to the documentation and the maintaining of the resources. This also helps keep stuff fresh. So if something has changed or there's a way that um, would make things more understandable and easier to grasp for brand new people, having new people contribute to the documentation and the maintenance of your project's uh, resources is the best way to make sure that your documentation stays fresh. Uh, and it also helps uh, like folks feel like ownership over the project because uh, they have been invited to uh, contribute to the documentation. Uh, and then also on this same tack, like making sure uh, that you double up on access. Like you wanna be the kind of project where um, you don't have to call someone like 
at their sister's wedding or at the birth of their first child because only one person has the password for the server. Um, and so this also helps you bring more people in. It helps you split up what might be one giant task into like two more manageable tasks, or uh, it helps you kind of like train people up to like sort of shadow uh, as, um, you know, uh, under someone else who's been at the project for a long time. So you never want to put yourself in a situation where only one person has a really important password or access to a really important resource. Uh, and then related to making sure everyone knows where everything is, is making sure everyone knows when and how decisions get made. Uh, and it's, uh, this just helps bring people in and understand the context for their work. Uh, so what you want to do is share your org chart if your org is big. If your org is two or three people, then when you do that onboarding, you let them know who the other two or three people are. Um, but if your organization is big or exists within like an NGO, like it has a fiscal sponsor and then like a, a little wing over here, and then you're like six layers down, uh, make sure that folks understand that so that they, when decisions do get made, they uh, have some sense of where they're coming from. Um, and uh, one thing that helps with this is to give people meaningful titles within your project so that uh, if everyone's an associate or an intern or like a hacker or a contributor, then it might be a little confusing, like why one person gets final say on a decision or why one person uh, seems to know like what's been going on with the project for 20 years. So giving people meaningful titles uh, is helpful for uh, acclimating people, but it's also helpful for making people feel uh, like part of your project when they come in. So you might give them something like, you know, security researcher on XYZ instead of summer associate. Uh, and then uh, related to the how decisions get made, if you share deadlines for um, internal proposals or external proposals or funding requests, share them in advance with everyone so that uh, maybe there's going to be a crunch time at the end. People know like, oh, it's going to be a little bit busy at the, on that last week. Or if they are working on research or data that's going to go into that proposal, they understand where the deadline's coming from. Uh, really less surprises and more ownership over the overall venture is going to help you get people doing the right thing, feeling like they know what they're doing and um, contributing in a good, meaningful way. Uh, and then number four, uh, make mistakes okay. Because um, People are definitely going to make mistakes. I promise you. They're going to overestimate timing. They're going to underestimate timing. They're going to lose stuff. They're going to misunderstand stuff. They're going to delete stuff. If you have a repo, that's good. But um, it's and it is good to make it so that people can like things can be rolled back if people accidentally delete large stuff. But people will make mistakes. Um, and you really want to make it okay. As much as you can model making mistake making okay, uh, you should do it. Uh, and then when people do make those mistakes, you want to help them learn from those mistakes. Uh, it's just, it's uh, like the sooner people get over the like, oh, I'll never make a mistake and, and find out like, ah, you make a mistake and then you learn from the mistake, uh, the better off they're going to be. And it also, you know, it, it, it helps them kind of feel uh, like, oh, I can be a human being, like we're not all perfect here and that's okay. Uh, and just to really hammer this in, if people are terrified, uh, then they're going to hide their mistakes. And then you're going to find out, you're going to find out eventually, like six months later, and it'll be like, why didn't you tell me? And it's like, oh, I was terrified. Uh, and so uh, you really want to make it okay for people to say when they're confused or they don't understand or they've made a mistake or they've forgotten something or they've missed a deadline or they deleted something. And then number five on building inclusive teams is celebrate your wins. Um, people forget this one because it seems like, oh, we have so much work to do. Let's get to the next project. But it's really important to celebrate your wins with your team, uh, like with the whole team, with everyone, not just like, uh, you know, the folks who did code, but everyone who contributed documentation or time or other resources to your project. Like maybe someone gave you advice on how to get a grant uh, to do your work. 
every single person who is part of your success should be thanked for their success. Um, and so that means if you do public thanks, like if you do a blog post or if you do uh, release notes or you do a conference talk about uh, the work that you've accomplished, uh, you should put everyone into your public thanks. And if you're not doing public thanks yet, then make sure you make uh, your rounds for internal thanks. So, um, and the, sometimes this takes the form of like a small gift or maybe it's a big group email where you list everybody's uh, work and thank them for it. Uh, small gifts that you might consider would be like something like a gift certificate or like a, like a funny t-shirt or something that people could keep on their desk uh, that just reminds them that you appreciate their work. So uh, I would be happy to take some questions about how this uh, connects to your work. And I'm going to stop sharing because I think I think I never did quite get that. The <laughs> uh, oh, no. All right. All right. How's that? <laughs> Excellent. Um, Cool. So I would be happy to take questions from people on this. Um, I don't have a team right now, but if you want to come work with me at the Seattle GNU Linux Fest, we'll start organizing on that in February. And that's uh, going to be a hybrid virtual in-person conference in Seattle. Amazing. So. Thank you so much, Deb. Uh, so we've, we've had a few um, Zoom, Zoom emoji claps, but I'll, I'll, I'll offer a silent one. Oh, okay. <laughs> ears from here as well. Um, we have a couple of questions through on the Etherpad. Um, oh, okay. So Lizana asks, I'd love to celebrate wins with everyone, but I struggle to find ways to do this in the online world that will um, sound different from the work itself. Any suggestions? Yeah, oh, that's interesting because uh, it can be kind of a bummer. Um, uh, everyone's sick of Zoom, right? Um, but sometimes you can just put it on the schedule, like on the agenda at the end of the meeting. Um, one thing that I've seen, like people do something kind of goofy, like, hey, everyone bring like your snack or like, hey, can everyone wear like a hilarious hat? Um, let's see. Uh, we, um, I think sometimes like, uh, like I said, like a gift card can be nice, like even if it's not like a party, but like, uh, you know, sending people like a, a gift card or something funny that has like the project logo on it. Um, like my husband has this thing. He it's probably like a 20 year old shirt, but it's got a really weird picture of like a worm genome diagram on it. It like makes no sense to anyone else. But he worked on it like probably like as a graduate student and he still wears it. And people are like, what's with the and he's like, oh, it's I, like I worked on this worm genome project. Like, uh, and so it doesn't necessarily have to try, like you don't have to necessarily try and um, recreate the office holiday party. I would bet you that more people than you would expect in this call probably can look at that worm genome and understand what it is because we probably oh. have quite a few life scientists here. Um, that might be, this might be the only room where that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> I know um, Eva has her hands up. Yeah, just in case of the example of celebration, because uh, me and my organization, the Coalition Clean Baltic, we did even uh, like uh, online Christmas party. <laughs> I know that it, uh, it might sound weird, but um, we did some like uh, funny exercises. Uh, we brought some um, like funny clothes or other stuff uh, to make it like feel more uh, Christmassy and more friendly, warm, etc. Uh, we made uh, even some uh, like goofy dances uh, before the screen. So like all, all yes, <laughs> all, all range of uh, this kind of behavior and. I need to admit that I'm not a fan of online uh, life. I prefer to be like, you know, face to face or, but uh, this has helped like to, to keep going the, uh, the atmosphere and uh, to bring people up despite the COVID situation and other stuff. Yeah. So that's for me. Yeah. I think maybe the for Siegel, the best social we did was a scavenger hunt where people uh, were asked to go get something from their house. And it was nerdy stuff like their worm shirts or like 
you know, if they had a programming book that was more than 20 years old or something like that. So, okay. but yeah, Go, was there, I don't want to leave a hanging, oh, the, the ether pad is uh, disappeared for me. So I don't know if there were other questions. There's one more from Emmy um, that I think we need to move on just in the interests of time. Uh, but Emmy asks, how can we hope, I don't know why I can't talk today. How can we help folks learn from their mistakes? Uh, yeah, so uh, that is a really good one. And it's one that a lot of people avoid because they're like, oh, it's going to be, I, they don't want to be the person that brings up people's mistakes. Um, and so uh, I think that uh, approaching it like, you know, or like in the, given the information you had at the time, I see how this went. Or like, you know, do you want to walk through it? And then you can get to that place where you're like, all right, given the information you had, I can see how this went. Uh, let's talk about ways that would help support you better next time. Um, you know, and like maybe another step where you send me a draft of something or whatever. Um, and then let people know that like you see a path forward to them contributing successfully like at, as they fix this thing and say like oh yeah well so if we could get the the formatting correct i think the work that you did was really great and i look forward to seeing it in the correct format next time so like a really positive spin going out of it so it's not like you don't like if you don't do that part then it the person is kind of sitting there like, am I on thin ice? Am I going to be like kicked out or, but you want to let them know that you see a path forward for them if they fix this one thing. So hopefully that's helpful. I know those are really um, uncomfortable conversations to have, like when people have made mistakes, but uh, I'll tell you what, like doing that compassionately uh, and, and just doing it is a gift because uh, the number of times, like I've definitely had people ask me things and they're like, do you know what happened here? And it's like, well, what happened when you all talked about it? And they're like, we never talked about it. I left, they left, the project imploded, we never spoke again. And I'm like, oh, so you will never be able to learn from that because nobody ever discussed it. So it is a hard conversation to have when someone's made a mistake or like you've made a mistake and not given them the right direction, but it's really important to do. And it really helps make your project stronger. And it really helps uh, you as a collaborator become a stronger collaborator. Thank you. That's really, really helpful. Uh, so I put contact information in there and I made the slides available. Uh, people can contact me. I'm probably going to scoot out because um, I've got some other stuff that I have to get to today. Uh, but it's been really nice to meet everyone. And thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much and have a great day. We really appreciate it. Bye. Okay, cool people. We are moving on to part two of this call. Um, so normally we do our ally skills sessions in approximately three hours. Today we have approximately 50 minutes. It's going to be squishy. <laughs> um, I don't know if we actually talked about who would kick off with the slides. Is that me, Emmy? Uh, okay, yep, looks like it is. Excellent. So let me just share my screen. Um, okay, and let's try desktop two. And then I'll put it into the share mode and get it onto the right slide. Uh, present. Come on. Do we see roughly what you'd expect to see at the moment? For me, it's missing the Right. The, the right half. Yeah, I, I noticed that as well. <laughs> okay, that's just rude. Oh, there we go. Okay, are we good? I've got thumbs up. Awesome. Okay, folks. Um, so the first thing that I'm just really quickly going to say um, is that when we're doing ally skills, um, if this is something that you're not bought into, um, it is okay to drop off. Uh, you, there's no need to complain, um, no need to argue or anything like that. Just drop off. Um, we, we won't hold it against anyone. Um, but if you want to be here and you want to participate, then we shall kick off. So um, we're aiming for roughly 25 minutes intro about what ally skills are. 
Um, and then we're going to break into groups to have some group discussions about this um, and try and squeeze in some Q&A um, at the end somehow if we are very, very speedy. So um, I'm just going to head straight into it and talk about technical privilege. And by technical, I mean not uh, specifically code, but uh, knowledge as well. So if, um, it could be, for example, um, related to me being a researcher or a scientist or some other type of skill that I may have that people give me privilege because of. Um, so it is, um, this is just one example of privilege, but I think one that's particularly common or likely to be one that we're encountering, um, since we're all people who are interested in research in some way, um, is that we often give, um, assign people a label, say that because of this label, they are therefore more, more important to listen to whether or not they actually have expertise in this area. So, for example, as a researcher, um, I have expertise in my research. I do not have expertise in anything else apart from that research. Um, so basically, just gen gently talking about privilege here, but we'll explain a bit more about what this means in a minute. Um, so actually, if you, you've been wondering what exactly ally skills are, then perhaps we should define these terms as well. Um, so we'll start with privilege, which I mentioned earlier. Um, privilege is an unearned advantage, um, which some people get, but not everyone, even though um, yeah, basically it, it, it's an uneven advantage that not everyone actually is able to um, partake of. Sorry, I don't know why my words are getting so stuck today. Um, oppression is the sy systemic pervasive inequality um, throughout society. Uh, typically one that benefits people who have privilege and um, gives less to people who do not have privilege. Has the side of my screen disappeared again? Yep, yeah, okay, I don't know. Um, I think my MacBook Air just does not like the idea of sharing a screen uh, on Zoom. Um, hopefully they'll come back, there we go. Um, another bit of terminology is a marginalized person, and this is a member of a group that is the primary target of a system of oppression. So often these are people who do not have as much privilege as others. Um, and an ally is a member of a social group that enjoys some privilege and works to end oppression and understand their own, own, own privilege. Um, so this is someone who actually recognizes that maybe that they've, they have some privilege um, and doesn't want to just enjoy it, but instead uses it for the benefit of others where they can when people do not have that privilege. Um, it's also worth mentioning these slides are linked to, I believe, in the etherpad, so you can follow along, it's even if half of my screen disappears for no apparent reason. <laughs> um, so a really important thing to note is you can't just wear a badge that says I am an ally. Um, because being an ally is about actions and things that you do. You can't say, you know, I'm your ally if you're not actually behaving like an ally. Um, so you might notice a scenario and say, it's time for me to practice my ally skills right now uh, or to apply my ally skills. Uh, and that's a situation you are being an ally, but you can't just say it because without action, it doesn't mean much. Um, so examples of this, uh, this is a... Um, somewhat possibly more American specific example, but I think it's, it's, it applies worldwide. Um, but a privilege is the ability to walk into a shop and have the owner assume that you're there to buy things and not to steal them. Um, whereas in some scenarios, let's say, um, again, specifically more, more um, in the US than anywhere else, I think, um, but definitely not only, um, people may assume that if you're black, you're more likely to be stealing something from that shop. Um, Whereas if you're white, you're less likely to have um, to suffer from that problem. OK, and now we'll, de we'll decompress a little bit more terminology. Um, so we've talked a little bit about privilege, but now we'll also talk about power. And often you may have privilege and power, but they're not necessarily the same thing. Um, so power is the ability to control circumstances or access resources and or privileges. Um, and another term that's very important is intersectionality. Um, so this is the recognition that actually you may be affected by multiple um, systems of oppression. So for example, it might be that you are um, black and disabled or mm -hmm. that you are um, a queer and a woman, for example. So there's many, many different scenarios where one or two or three or four of these may combine. Um, and it tends to be that the more of these that, are, that you are affected by uh, is, um, means that you face even more barriers than someone else. Um, and so after having 
de decompressed quite a few of these terms that we'll be using throughout this. And uh, we'll say, why are we focusing on ally skills? Um, and what we found, or when I say we, I mean, researchers have found is that when marginalized people speak up for themselves, they are judged badly for doing so. So someone's complaining, you know, oh, she's complaining about feminism again or something. Um, whereas if someone else stands up for them and says, hey, we shouldn't be sexist, they tend to look virtuous. Um, so the person who stands up, the person who's acting as an ally, um, is able to help the situation in a way that a person standing up for themselves may not at the same time as also actually um, being judged better for doing exactly the same action. Um, and so an example here, uh, one that might be relatable, I think it was 2020 when uh, Timnit Gebru uh, was um, fired from work, working in Google for speaking up around ethics. Um, and it's very easy to believe that because she was speaking up for these kinds of issues, that that may be why she was fired as well. Uh, whereas if someone else had spoken up, it's also possible that that may not have been how it would have gone. Um, so I'm going to just mute for two minutes, uh, just for an exercise. Uh, so if you have a look, there's a link, I think, in the etherpad for this, and I will stop sharing as well. Uh, but we have an exercise just to look at the privileges that you may have. So there's a worksheet where you can just look and see, see which ones you may have. Uh, usually when you do this, we find people realize they have some unexpected privileges that they don't realize they necessarily had. And thank you, Amy, for uh, posting that into the chat as well. <clears throat> Um, can I have a thumbs up, please? Perfect. All right. So um, what this workshop is, we've tried to explain a little bit. I think it's also good to talk about what it is not. It's not a certification, it's not an apology, and it's not a get out of jail free cause. Um, we don't, we're not legal personnel. Um, we don't represent anyone's or anyone's employers, and we're not giving legal advice. Um, this is a space and the time to, for us to discuss uh, the types of oppression that exist and they should be stopped. It's not the time to talk about what types of oppression is bad or whether it exists or not. So just to be clear with that upfront, we're assuming that you agree that there are oppressions, systemic oppressions. Um, as we said, uh, you can leave or return at any time without any reason, you don't have to explain. Um, it is recorded, <laughs> um, but we will not record the discussion, uh, I believe, that we will have later, um, but it is transcribed uh, via Otter for uh, those who are looking at the transcription. Um, if you do share sensitive stories now or later, please try and anonymize them. Pretend that we are just people that you met at a conference. Um, and uh, share at the level that you'd be comfortable at at that point. So a um, couple of tips or basics when it comes to practicing ally skills. Um, be short, simple, and firm. That's usually the most effective. Um, don't try to be funny. Um, when you try to be funny, there's a lot, it's very easy to end up hurting some other groups unintentionally. So just don't. Um, play for the audience. So situations are complex. There are people in the room that will affect, you know, how effective the response is. So it's always good to keep that in mind. And let's say, you know, you're in 
you're the only PhD candidate in the room full of PIs, then you may want a different response compared to, you know, when you're in a student organization, for example. Uh, practice makes perfect. So practice simple responses like, hey, this is not cool. Um, I, I don't think that's okay. These are almost always safe and effective. And last but not least, and we're gonna go into that a little bit more later as well, pick your battles. We don't, and we don't have to, and we can't fight everything. So I would say um, always your safety and your well-being is the most important in all of the scenarios. And so um, it's always good to keep that in mind when you choose your fights. When you're trying to help one group, don't be all of these things here on the list. Don't be sexist, don't be homophobic or transphobic, don't be racist, don't be ableist, don't be classist, ageist, don't body shame, don't describe people as sexually undesirable, unattractive. Just don't. <laughs> Awkward. So here's some cute foxes to diffuse that a little bit. Oh, so cute. I love how these are CC by images as well. Sorry, <laughs> but cute open images. We need more of these. What if we make, what if I make a mistake? Um, as that was saying, you know, I hope that you're in a, in a community and a space where you are allowed to learn from and grow from your mistake. So if you do make a mistake, apologize, correct yourself and move on. That's all you need to do. Um, I've made plenty of mistakes in the past. Um, so I was at a conference two years ago when I called someone who um, identified with the pronouns they, them uh, by gen gender pronouns that I just assumed. So I realized my mistake. I approached them after our conversation um, and I said, I'm really sorry. And they were extremely accepting um, and we moved on. So you, we will make, make mistakes. We all make mistakes as Deb said um, and apologize. Learn from it and move on. Okay, so um, we're gonna start putting you in groups, I think. Um, and we are going to start discussing scenarios. All of these things sound a bit scary. So let me just take two minutes to walk everyone through. Um, so you will be, you, we will be given, each group will be given a scenario. I think we have two scenarios that are gonna come um, and you will be given either one of them where you will be discussing the scenario in your group. So, um, when you're in your group, introduce yourself briefly. Um, choose a moderator to uh, who will be in charge of paying attention to who are dominating discussions um, and try to invite others to share. Um, you can also, other, other people who are not moderators can moderate the moderator. Um, it's also a good idea to take someone, to choose someone to take notes and report on what you discuss in this case, because um, we will, be reporting out and sharing what we've discussed later. Um, you don't have to join groups, but yeah, we will. You will get the breakout room pop up, but you don't have to join if you don't want to. Okay, so what is a scenario? Um, I'm going to come back to this in a bit. So a scenario is something that looks a bit like this. So this is an example. We're going to walk through it. So uh, is an example uh, case or story. Um, so here at a meeting, a woman makes a suggestion, but no one picks up on it. Later on in the meeting, a man makes the same suggestion and then is given credit for the suggestion. So when you see this, when you see your scenario, what we'd like you to do is to um, focus on how someone could act on the scenario as an ally Sorry, it could act as an ally in the scenario words <laughs> um, and not as the marginalized person. Um, so 
if you are not sure exactly what that situation is, or you have different interpretations between all of you within the group, then pick one um, and discuss that because otherwise you may end up with most of the discussion around, you know, but I don't interpret it the same way. So it's good to just pick one, settle on it and discuss around that. There aren't any trick scenarios, by the way. So going back to our example, um, think about as an ally, uh, what would you do in this scenario? So for example, in this case, a response as an ally could be that uh, we'd like to we like to have in the meeting a moderator, a note taker, and a facilitator to make sure that um, people's contributions are, or suggestions are recognized and is given credit for. I think previously when we discussed this scenario, there were also very great suggestions about um, powers of note takers and, and um, secretaries being the ones who document like who actually said what. So that's, that's a great role to have. And it's also something that you could discuss. Um, so I walked through that scenario really quickly. Sorry if it sounds really confusing, but you could say, for example, that it's really good to have facilitators, timekeepers, note takers, and moderators in a meeting. That's a, res a response that you could have as an ally. There are other ones. So I hope I haven't lost everyone by this point. Um, so as I discussed, as I described, um, we're gonna have two different scenarios, I believe. Um, you're gonna get told which one you're gonna do, I think, um, in your group. And I'm looking at Yo to see, yeah, rooms are ready. So uh, I see on the ether pad that um, group one would be doing scenario three. And group three would be also doing scenario three. And group two will be doing scenario two. Okay, so all the numbers, very confusing. Let's walk through what they are. The text is also on the ether patch. So scenario two, what would an ally do in this case? A colleague of yours says, it's great to hire more people of color, but let's not lower the bar. Before you can reply, another colleague says, oh yes, we'll be careful not to lower the bar. As an ally, what would you do? This is scenario two, so this is for group two. Um, and then, sorry, <laughs> group three. And group one and three will discuss this scenario, so scenario three. On a professional mailing list that you be belong to, a semi-famous semi colleague who came out as trans a year ago starts a discussion. In the response thread, another person repeatedly misgenders them by using incorrect pronouns. What would you do as an ally? on the mailing list. So you will have, I believe, 20, 20 minutes? I think 20 sounds good, yeah. Great, okay. Yeah, 20 minutes, um, take your time, introduce yourself briefly, choose a moderator, choose a note taker, um, and walk through the scenario as you would as an ally. Um, and yeah. Do we have any questions, confuse, confusions, concerns? Okay. Should we? Okay. Um, I'm opening the rooms. Um, as always, if you need help, um, remember just to use the ask for help function or you can hop out the room to visit us but they're opening now. <laughs>